Thank you and good afternoon to everyone. It's really a pleasure to be here. Um, thank you so much to Betty and the Colorado Interfaith Power and Light and all of the sponsors and Peter Sautel, all of you guys, you're such an amazing witness for the integrity of creation. So really fun to be here and to be with like-minded people and to be with people who are looking for ways to move from despair to leadership around the climate. And I love it. I absolutely love it when people of faith get together and make a big holy stink about something that really needs to be made. You know, can I get an amen? amen. I mean, we need to make a stink about what's happening in creation. And here we are doing it in a holy way. I, I, I was raised to be a lady. You know, you don't say much uh, unless it's, can I get you some coffee? Um, but to really, you know, make a stink. And that takes a little bit of work. That takes some momentum. So we need each other to uh, preach to each other, to be choir to each other, and to be uh, prophetic towards one another. So I hope that I have the opportunity, uh, that I accomplish that opportunity today. I had the privilege of writing a couple of books on the care of creation and a couple of years ago. One was called Seven Simple Steps to Green Your Church. And the other was called Green Church, Reduce, reuse, recycle, I wanted repent, but the editor said rejoice at the end. <laughs> and there are a few other R's in there too. There, there is repent and there's reclaim. And I found though that people tend to focus on one of the R's. Can you guess which one? Recycling, recycling. yeah, recycling. Now recycling is good. In fact, in the Christian tradition, we've built a whole holiday around the theme of holy recycling. A little holiday built around the redemptive nature of recycling. And we call that Easter, right? Easter. Um, new life can come out of old life, right? The dead can rise. There's a possibility for new heaven and a new earth. And personally, I think that resurrection is the ultimate in recycling. It's upcycling. It's not even downcycling. It's things coming to a higher quality. I mean, not only can plastic bottles become clothing, and not only can milk jugs become park benches, and not only can all of that happen, but the dead can rise. It's a pretty good holiday. So recycling is good. I'm an avid recycler. I'm all in favor of it. It saves natural resources, reduces our carbon footprint, gets kids involved, helps people get a handle on the climate crisis, a way in. But let's tell the truth here, if we can. It's not everything. It's not everything. In fact, on a scale of light green to deep green, it's light green. It's light green. And I believe it's imperative, imperative, to move the conversation from a light lime green to a deep forest green. We've got to move the conversation to deep green ways of being. Because even now, even with all the creative recycling that we've been doing, even with all the ways that we've been bringing new life out of old, even now, the creation is perishing. Even now. We are the only species on earth, writes farmer and author Verlin Klinkenborg, that has the, that has the uh, capable of an ethical awareness of other species. And thus, we are the only species capable of happily ignoring that awareness. I don't suppose, he writes, that most Americans would actively go out and kill a whippoorwill if they had the chance, yet in the past 40 years, the numbers of that songbird have dropped by 1.6 million. In our everyday economic behavior, we seem determined to discover whether we can live on life, we, we can live on earth alone. Wow. Can you imagine a life without birds? Would you want to? Would you want your kids and grandkids to not know the sweet chirps of spring and summer and autumn? And yet we are bequeathing a world very different to future generations than the one that we inherited. Many of you will remember the old school paranormal TV show, The Twilight Zone. Do, 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 do. Right? Something spooky was always happening in the Twilight Zone. 
Well, in many ways, Mother Earth is now experiencing an ecological twilight zone. And what's spooky is that life itself is disappearing from the planet. The Species Alliance, which tracks this sort of thing, reports that all over the world, animal and plant species are disappearing at an unprecedented and alarming rate. Folks, we are in the middle of what seems to be the consensus of the largest mass extinction since the age of the dinosaurs, the sixth great extinction. Scientists believe that up to half of all species on Earth may be gone within the next 50 years. Half. Now, we're talking everything from phytoplankton to frogs and songbirds and saltwater fish and tigers and lions and polar bears. Oh, my. Unless you think phytoplankton, no problem. Let me tell you a little bit about phytoplankton. They're little one-celled plantlets that float on the surface of the ocean. Some of you know what phytoplankton are. They float on the surface of the ocean, and they are at the very bottom of the ocean's food chain. They're breakfast for everything from shrimp to whales. Shrimp to whales. So no phytoplankton, no shrimp cocktail. Now you may be thinking, okay, well, I don't eat shrimp. I keep kosher or whatever. I don't eat shrimp. But you know, other fish do. Other fish do. And there's more. Phytoplankton, together with the trees, especially the Amazon forest, are the lungs of the planet. They take in carbon dioxide and they release oxygen. In fact, every second breath that we breathe originates from the oceans, from phytoplankton. How long can you hold your breath? No phytoplankton, no oxygen, or half the oxygen. Decreased oxygen, less breath of life. Less breath of life, well, you get the picture. And that's just one species that's disappearing. You know, sometimes when I think about this, I go numb. I go absolutely numb. And sometimes I just weep. I mean, really, there's no other rational response but to grieve. And it occurs to me that maybe much of the debate over climate change is really grounded in grief. It's grief. And I get it. It's a grief that cannot bear to face the realities of how quickly the Earth is changing around us and how much and what the consequences will be. And what with the dramatic increase in the frequency and intensity of so-called natural disasters, I think they're unnatural disasters, but drought and flooding and fires, the tornadoes this morning, even the earthquakes, there's a great deal of discussion that all the earthquakes in the Midwest uh, may be due to fracking, you know, our extraction of natural gas from the earth. Not to mention the rise in temperatures. I mean, wasn't that a great march? It was beautiful, right? It was climate change. Don't you wish the meteorologists would say that? You know, Channel 7, that guy's driving a Prius, but I'm, I don't watch Channel 7 from Denver. I don't know if he's talking about climate change, but gosh, we need to make those connections. We broke over 15,000 individual temperature records in the United States last month alone. Climate change. Wow. We are definitely moving into a new normal. Definitely moving into a new normal. Now, to emphasize that point, award-winning author, activist, climate activist, and sometime Methodist Sunday school teacher, Bill McKibben, wrote a book called Earth. E-A-A-R-T-H. He put two A's in there just to tell you it's like the old Earth, but it's not quite the same as the old Earth. What's changed? Well, species extinction, climate change, of course, and pushing all of that, population. Population. One of the biggest changes in the last 50 years has been the population explosion. 
At the end of World War II, we'd gotten all the way up to two billion people. It's a lot of people, because when seven, it's around 1776 when the country was born, there was just about one billion people. Then by the end of World War II, two billion people. Well, today, seven billion people on the planet and rising. Seven billion. And by the time the boomer generation is gone, the numbers will probably be up to nine or 10 billion people, all in one lifetime. We went from two to maybe nine or 10 billion people. So that changes things, you know, considerably. We can't live on the planet the way we did when Be Fruitful and Multiply was committed to parchment. There were 50 million people on the planet then. Very different planet than we're living on today. Let me give you an example. I grew up in a family of seven people, five kids, five kids, and it didn't take us five kids long to scour the pantry when my mom had gotten home from one of the weekly shopping trips. And we were looking for treats, you know, Twinkies, chips, you know, junk food. And if we found it, ooh, it didn't take long for that to get gobbled up. And on more than one occasion, my mom would say to me, you kids are eating me, you know how this goes, out of house and home, right? Out of house and home. So now consider a family not of seven, but seven billion. Seven billion, seven billion kids and adults and lots and lots of teenagers, and they're all hungry. And everybody's looking for treats. And not just Twinkies and, and chips, good food and a lot of food. And not just water, clean please, but TVs and cars and cell phones and computers and travel and open space and cheap fuel and books and restaurants and theaters and places to worship and beautiful homes and all the rest of the stuff that we think constitutes the good life. Now the definitions may vary a little bit from culture to culture, but everybody wants the good life, understandable. Betty mentioned entitlement before. This is entitlement right here. And everybody is entitled to a good life. So what does Mother Earth say then? You humans, you kids, you're eating me out of house and home. But not Twinkies and chips here, but topsoil, good topsoil, open space, potable water, running rivers, fresh air, healthy forests, abundant fish, herds of wildlife, healthy, intact ecosystems that support life. Here's what's happening. Seven billion of us, and we are all consuming so much of what Earth offers that it would take anywhere from three to eight planets, three to eight whole planets, to support us, to support everybody like the average American is living. Now, may I remind you, we don't have that much. And everything we have comes from the earth. Now, you may think, well, not my soda pop and my neon chips and, you know, and not uh, computers. Oh, yeah, everything originates from the earth. There isn't anything we have that doesn't come from the earth. Three to eight whole planets is what it would take to support everybody in the way that we are accustomed to living. So, back to recycling. Recycling, while part of the solution, it can't fix it. It simply can't fix this. Because the problem is not so much what we do with our leftovers, with our waste, with our refuse, except for carbon dioxide, which is a leftover that we have not really taken into account. We haven't figured out how to recycle that either. But it's not so much what, what, what's left over, it's what we're consuming that's the problem. My mom didn't worry about the wrappers that were left over after we got into the Twinkies and the chips. She worried about empty shelves and how to restock them. So in our insatiable hunger, seemingly insatiable hunger, for more, 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 we are literally pushing much of the rest of life out of existence. We are literally pushing much of the rest of life out of existence. And I don't need to tell you that we cannot live on a dying planet. We can't live on a barren planet. It just doesn't work that way. And all the world's religions tell us that. It's buried in each one of our sacred texts. We are inseparable from nature. 
From Judaism, we learn of this deep connection from the story of the first humans, Adam and Eve. Now the word, uh, the Hebrew word for Adam, Adam, it's not a nice man's name. It means earth, earth. And Eve comes from the Hebrew word Chaya, which means life. So just like Eve is taken out of Adam's side, all life comes from the earth. All life comes from the earth. Christianity, in addition to drawing from those deep wells of wisdom, envisions Jesus as the firstborn of creation, the firstborn of creation through whom all creation comes and in whom all creation holds together. It's as if Jesus is midwifing creation. Jesus is the midwife. Islam, I don't know how much you know about Islam apart from whatever you may read in the news, but what a gorgeous environmental ethic contained in the Quran, in the Hadith. Islam teaches that humans are vice regents, trustees, if you will, of the creation, and that the whole world is a mosque. The whole world is sacred, and sacred and fitting for worship, pure and clean. Buddhism teaches compassion for every living thing. Why? Because all things, including we humans, exist by our inner relationship with one another on the earth. For the Buddhist, to think that we are disconnected from the earth is to be unrealistic. Hinduism in particular has a deep concern for connections between us and the rest of creation. And Hinduism teaches that resources in the world become scarce because people use them for their own ends. To us, that's like, duh, right? We do, we know that. But they teach that that's a problem. That's a problem. We are to use the world unselfishly in order to maintain the natural balance and to repay God for the gifts that we've been given. And native traditions, of course, teach us the deep interconnectedness. In fact, I think that it's the native traditions and our awareness of them that have really brought us back to looking in our own text. Well, what do we say about this? And lo and behold, we found that it's there too. It's in all of the world religions. There's so much. There's so much for us to learn from our own traditions and from each other's traditions. Unfortunately, many of us, um, pastor of this church accepted, and thank you so much for that, but so many of us in our churches, in our synagogues, in our mosques, in our temples, we are not paying attention. We are living as if we're the center. It's us, baby. It's us. And as long as we got what we need and what we want, everything's cool. We're partying like it's 1999. We can't go on that way anymore. And that's entitlement again. That's exactly what Betty was talking about, that entitlement. So case in point, our consumption of fossil fuels. Over the last 100 years, Bill McKibben writes, we have been burning every barrel of oil, every cubic foot of natural gas, and every ton of coal we can get our hands on. And we have devised some new ways to get at tons of coal. We now take the tops of mountains, which have been conveniently relabeled overburden, and blow them off the top of a mountain into the valley below, suffocating rivers, people, and community, so we can get really quickly at the coal in exposed seams. Now they say that they rebuild the mountain again, which is really great, but there's no getting all that back up there. Wow. At the same time, CO2 and other greenhouse gases released from the burning of these fossil fuels are being pumped into the atmosphere, not taken into account by any economic equations, trapping heat, which causes climate change, global warming, producing the massive shifts that we're experiencing in our climate right now. Do you remember when you really had to wear a winter coat in winter? You remember when you had to put on a scarf and mittens and a hat, and if it was a really bad day, something over your face and boots and warm socks and long johns? I grew up in Connecticut and went to school in Vermont, and my folks sent me off packed to the gills with winter clothes. Do you know kids don't even know what winter coats are anymore? They don't even know what winter coats are anymore. In Wyoming, I see kids all the time in shorts in the winter. Wow. The world has really changed. And remember when you didn't need to use air conditioning in the summer? In Wyoming now, you need to. If you want to stay cool, things have really, really changed. 
So, what's a species to do? Well, let's not discount the real theological possibility of despair, okay? Can we, just say, can we just say that? I mean, there comes a time when you just want to put your head in your hands and say, OMG, what are we doing to ourselves and how are we going to get out of it? Despair is a good theological option and I think we ought to hold it as an option. But when you raise your head, there is work to be done. There is work to be done. I remember how I began to answer the call to care for God's good gift of creation. I grew up in an interfaith home. Betty mentioned I grew up Orthodox. Actually, I grew up in, uh, with a Reformed Jewish mom and a Catholic dad, an interfaith home, and I learned well the texts, the shared texts of Torah and Old Testament. And I knew what the psalmist had to say about creation, and I knew that the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, and I knew what it was to play out in the backyard alone without a helicopter parent, and to get lost in the woods and be covered with poison ivy. I knew the joys of discovering nature for myself. And I went off to the environmental studies program at the University of Vermont in great measure to try to figure out what poison ivy looked like so I never had to be covered with it again in summer. And while I, while I was there, I got quite the education. We learned all about population and pollution and quality of life and how all of that interconnects with how ecosystems function and land use planning and all of that. And I came away thinking, wow, it's really, really clear. And I went off to pursue some work in the acid rain, with acid rain studies for the state of Vermont and water quality and did some uh, volunteer uh, being of a naturalist. And then my spiritual journey continued and it seemed to draw me deeper and deeper within. And I left the world of environmental awareness behind as if somehow the two, spirituality and, and uh, the creation were, were separate. But for me at that time, they were. I didn't really get the full connection. I wound up in ministry, and I thought, you know what, they explained that so clearly in my environmental studies program, I just know somebody is going to do something about that. This, this is going to get fixed. And, and a lot of work was done, and a lot of good work, and a lot of the localized pollution problems were dealt with. And a lot of that was, but not all of it. And I ended up in ministry, and I wound up serving churches for over a decade, much of which I really, really enjoyed. And my environmental awareness, for the most part, just receded. It took a backseat. And then came vacation of 2006. And my husband and I were on vacation. We had left Rollins, Wyoming, where we were. And we saw the movie uh, marquee that said, An Inconvenient Truth. And we ducked into a matinee to watch this. Let me tell you, it was inconvenient, because here we are on vacation. And you know when you go into a matinee, and you sort of come out dazed and confused anyway, because you're not really sure you know, what time it is? Well, we came out dazed and flabbergasted from this movie. I mean, jaws hanging open about what we had just seen. And that's when we traded in the old car for the hybrid. And that's also when I realized that the somebody who was going to have to do something about this had to include me. It had to include me. I had to be part of it somehow. And so I got on the phone and I called, I called Peter Sattel. I said, Peter, what are the Methodists doing? Can you tell me? And he told me, you know, I don't remember, it sort of added up to not much. Um, and then he said, uh, uh, Al Gore is going to be training some people, you know, about a thousand people and see if you can get in on that. So I looked online and it was like one day left to get in the application. I put in my application. I got accepted. I left local church ministry and I went around and I made a ton of presentations. And I began to really see the connections, the real connections between creator and creation, between climate and our way of living. And then I began to run workshops and teach classes and write these books to help build bridges of understanding. In short, to begin to make a holy stink about climate change. Now I should tell you, if you're pastoring a church and you're preaching, there are only so many stinks they'll put up with, you know, in a given uh, church cycle. And I felt like I had run out of my allotted number of stinks. And so it was time to sort of go out and, and uh, raise a ruckus in somebody else's church. And so I've been doing that. <laughs> Um, quite happily. So that's one person's response, one person's option to what do we do about this. You know, somebody else puts solar on their house and buys a Prius and sells all this electricity, you know, back to the state, and, and everybody's got their own way of doing it. But I want to tell you that 
all that we're doing puts us right in line with the very best of our religious traditions. It puts us in line with the prophets and with Moses and with Jesus. And I don't know how much of a stink the Buddha made, but people are still paying attention to what he had to say. It, this is our religious birthright, is to reinvent things when they're going awry. And as it turns out, that's exactly what's happening. Thomas Berry once said, if a society's cultural world, the dreams that have guided it to a certain point, become dysfunctional, the society must go back and dream again. And that's exactly what's happening. We are redreaming a world. We are redreaming a creation. And many insightful observers are noting that now. Rabbi Rami Shapiro notes that we are in the beginning stages of the second axial age in which the golden rule, which appeared in all religious teachings uh, between this certain period, like 800 BCE to 200 CE, that was the first axial age, Okay, golden rule appears. Now in the second axial age, the golden rule is now being extended to all of creation. All of creation, not just do unto others as you would have them do unto you, but do unto Mother Earth as you would have her do unto you. Don't do unto Mother Earth what you don't want her to do unto you. And Diana Butler Bass, noted author who makes connections between religion and culture and congregations also affirms there is a huge shift going on in the religious world. People of every faith, every faith, are reconsidering what brings meaning to our lives. And we are in this potent period of remaking, re-envisioning, and remaking our world. She calls this time an awakening. In fact, she identifies it as the fourth great awakening in North American history. But she cautions us. It's not automatic. And Rabbi Shapiro says this too. It's not automatic that we're going to see the second axial age all the way through. It's not guaranteed that we're all or enough of us going to wake up in time. She says awakenings take work as human beings respond to the promptings of God's spirit in the world. Yes, some things will, will cease to work, she says. They're not going to make sense anymore. Um, religion that simply gives comfort will no longer suffice. Institutions that only struggle to maintain themselves will probably fall away. Political parties, she says, they'll wither. I haven't seen that yet. But meaning in political parties may well wither. Religions may lose their power to inspire. But that only means, she says, that we have work to do here and now to find new paths of meaning, new ways to connect with God and neighbor, to form new communities, to organize new ways of making the world a better place. So here we are, the best of times and the worst of times. We got a global catastrophe unfolding on the one hand, and on the other hand, a new unfolding of the human spirit. A fresh wind of God's prompting coming to us, a re-envisioning of life itself. And frankly, you all are the perfect example of it right here. Interfaith, power, and light. It's beautiful. That's absolutely it. Interfaith, power, and light. You are part of this new life coming out of old. So to contribute and to further this great awakening, I'd like to suggest three R's. And no, recycling isn't one of them. But I'd like to suggest the R of rethink. Rethink. You know, we have bought into an economic mindset that says constant economic growth is healthy and it's necessary and it's the only way to go. May I suggest that in a body we call limitless growth cancer? And we don't think that's so great. In fact, we rush off to the doctor to figure out how to get that thing back within normal bounds and maybe eradicate it altogether before it springs up someplace else. Cancer cells don't pay attention to normal boundaries. They outgrow where they're supposed to be and then they ultimately consume a body from the inside out and eat a body out of house and home. And in a sense, that's exactly what this model of economics is doing. Uncontrolled growth necessitates uncontrolled consumption. Let us review. Uncontrolled consumption leaves Mother Hubbard's cupboards bare and the climate boiling. Okay, and it takes three to eight planets to do it. So that's where we're headed. 
And that's that model of more, 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 grow, 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 got to keep going. So I think we have some rethinking to do about what's really driving us, what economic model we're really buying into. And secondly, this shouldn't surprise anybody, repent. You knew I was going to get that word in, right? We have to repent. Now, whether you're Jewish or you're Buddhist or you're Christian or you're Muslim or you're Hindu or you're native or you're all of the above, or none of the above, spiritual but not religious, we have to repent of the destruction that we have caused. And frankly, that's been caused in our name. A lot of this we've just simply inherited. We didn't know. We've inherited it. But it has been done in our name. And then we have to turn back to the source, capital S, for new inspiration, new ways of living, new guidance, to be stewards of the creation and not just consumers of the creation. You ever notice how we're always referred to as consumers? As if that's our only role in life? Like, what happened to citizen, you know? What happened to some of those other ways of thinking of ourselves? We're only considered consumers. I challenge you to make a holy stink about that. That ought to preach. Don't you think, Peter? That ought to preach, yeah. So each of our sacred texts has a vision for us. We're not bereft here. Honoring the Sabbath comes to us from the Jewish and Christian texts. Living Simply, uh, the uh, book of Acts, gives a whole beautiful vision of that. Sharing our resources, stewardship, seeing the sacred in all of creation, living lightly as well as living simply, practicing compassion, it's all there. It's in our texts. All we have to do is go back and look for it. So with that in mind, it's time for the third R, which is reduce. And I think this is by far the most important R. In the global West, we, especially Americans, have a tremendous sense of entitlement. And I'm not talking about Medicare or Social Security here, you know, when I'm talking about entitlement. I, I, you know, you can, honest people disagree on that. I actually think they're extremely important safety nets for the middle class and for the poor, especially as the planet grows more precarious this tough new planet that we're making a life on. But I'm talking about the sense of entitlement that it's an unrealistic, unmerited or inappropriate expectation of favorable living conditions and favorable treatment at the hands of others. Now I can relate to this definition and that's especially scary because I got it off a website that deals with personality disorders. <laughs> and it seems to me that maybe our whole society has a personality disorder. We want, we want, we want. Never mind it's killing the planet. We want, we want, we want. We are manifesting personality disorder. We're killing ourselves. We are killing ourselves and we still want it. So how do we counter this sense of entitlement? May I suggest that in the age of big houses, big debt, big carbon footprint, big screen TVs, big bellies, big bailouts, big bonuses, big recession, big unemployment, big natural disasters, and big extinctions, it's time to go on a diet. It's time to go, you know, they used to call those reducing plans. It's time to go on a diet. It wasn't that long ago that respected economist E.F. Schumacher, 1970s, proposed an economics as if people and the planet mattered. He called it small is beautiful. Remember that? Small is beautiful. He called it Buddhist economics. Because it's really true, unbridled desire causes suffering. And he disagreed with using the gross national product to measure human well-being. That's our current indicator. How are we doing? How you, how you has the gross national product. I'm good. We're good. Right? He said the aim ought to be maximum amount of well-being with the minimum amount of consumption. Now, when's the last time you heard that? Probably the 1970s. There are all kinds of things we can reduce immediately. Bottled water. If you're still using bottled water, please, 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 please don't. Not only does it create all this waste, but it steals water out of communities, and it creates a commodity price for something you can get out of the faucet for pennies. Pennies. And it's often cleaner. So what can we give up? Bottled water, heat settings in our homes. Take those down and up in the summer. The amount of driving we do, the amount of advertising we're exposed to, that's what's driving the more, more, more. Would you really need the next iPod if you didn't know it existed? <laughs> Would you really need the next version of the cell phone if you didn't know it was out? Maybe not. 
Maybe not. The list goes on and on, and maybe we'll find, as the Quakers suggest, tis a gift to be simple, tis a gift to be free. Now, personal reduction of consumption is good, but like recycling, it is not enough to turn things around. It's not enough. We also need to link up with like-minded people and like-minded organizations and take on some of the corporate bigs. Big oil, big coal. Now, I don't say those things lightly. My husband's in the oil business. I live in Wyoming, powers the entire economy coal and natural gas. But the top climate scientists say we must dramatically reduce corporate, uh, fossil fuels in order to dramatically reduce carbon dioxide levels in the atmosphere, in order to dramatically reduce the danger our way of living poses to life, life itself. That means we cannot go on with business as usual. We can't. We simply can't. So, it's time. It's time for us to gird our loins. It's time for us to summon a new level of courage. It's time for us to know that we are not alone. It's time to know and acknowledge that we're in the middle of the second axial age and the fourth great awakening, and there is energy, and there is hope, and there are people just like you and I that are working all over the planet to ensure that every second breath continues to exist to ensure that life after our generation will be bearable? Courage. That's what it will take to extend the golden rule to all of creation. That's what it will take to truly wake up. Courage to envision a new earth community that works for everyone. And that's where congregations come in. That's where congregations come in. Bill McKibben notes that communities of faith are one of the few institutions that posit a reason for existence other than accumulation. We have a reason for being that doesn't actually involve getting more stuff. Now, not only that, we understand short-term sacrifice for long-term gain. We know how to gather and pray and feed each other and act. We know how to respond in times of crisis. We know in our best moments how to preach and pray and prophesy. And best of all, we've always figured out how to do it on a shoestring budget. So it's time. It's really time for us, people of faith, to stand up and make a holy stink about creation, about the integrity of creation, about climate change, and connect those dots between climate change and fossil fuels and the way that we live and the hope that we have in each of our religious traditions. It's time for us to make a holy stink in our sanctuaries, in our religious education classes, in our neighborhoods, in our communities, in letters to the editor, in public hearings, in the halls of Congress, wherever we can. Because it's that important. It's life itself that we're talking about. In the end, I think we're the ones that the world has been waiting for. We're the ones that have the chance to make a true difference. So in the name of Creator, in the name of creation, in the name of all creatures, let us be of good, cur good courage to rethink, to repent, to reduce, and yes, to recycle, so that all might live. Amen. Amen. Thank you, and good afternoon to everyone. It's really a pleasure to be here. Um, thank you so much to Betty and the Colorado Interfaith Power and Light and all of the sponsors and Peter Sautel, all of you guys. You're such an amazing witness for the integrity of creation. So really fun to be here and to be with like-minded people and to be with people who are looking for ways to move from despair to leadership around the climate. And I love it. I absolutely love it when people of faith get together and make a big holy stink about something that really needs to be made. You know, can I get an amen? amen? I mean, we need to make a stink about what's happening in creation. And here we are doing it in a holy way. I, I was raised to be a lady. You know, you don't say much uh, unless it's, can I get you some coffee? 
um, but to really, you know, make a stink. And that takes a little bit of work. That takes some momentum. So we need each other to uh, preach to each other, to be choir to each other, and to be uh, prophetic towards one another. So I hope that I have the opportunity, uh, that I accomplish that opportunity today. I had the privilege of writing a couple of books on the care of creation and a couple of years ago. One was called Seven Simple Steps to Green Your Church. And the other was called Green Church, Reduce, Reuse, Recycle. I wanted repent, but the editor said rejoice at the end. <laughs> Keep forest green. We've got to move the conversation to deep green ways of being. Because even now, even with all the creative recycling that we've been doing, even with all the ways that we've been bringing new life out of old, even now, the creation is perishing. Even now. We are the only species on earth, writes farmer and author Verlin Klinkenborg, that has the, that has the uh, capable of an ethical awareness of other species. And thus, we are the only species capable of happily ignoring that awareness. Bottles become clothing, and not only can milk jugs become park benches, and not only can all of that happen, but the dead can rise. It's a pretty good holiday. <laughs> so recycling is good. I'm an avid recycler. I'm all in favor of it. It saves natural resources reduces our carbon footprint, gets kids involved, helps people get a handle on the climate crisis, a way in. But let's tell the truth here, if we can. It's not everything. It's not everything. In fact, on a scale of light green to deep green, it's light green. It's light green. And I believe it's imperative, imperative, to move the conversation from a light lime green to a deep <laughs> And there are a few other R's in there, too. There, there is repent and there's reclaim. And I found, though, that people tend to focus on one of the R's. Can you guess which one? Recycling. recycling, yeah, recycling. Now, recycling is good. In fact, in the Christian tradition, we've built a whole holiday around the theme of holy recycling. A little holiday built around the redemptive nature of recycling. And we call that Easter, right? Easter. Um, new life can come out of old life, right? The dead can rise. There's a possibility for new heaven and a new earth. And personally, I think that resurrection is the ultimate in recycling. It's upcycling. It's not even downcycling. It's things coming to a higher quality. I mean, not only can plastic bottles